Welcome to Pressure Point. Our topic this program, Resolving the Land Question Together. I'm your co-host, Valerie Dudeward. And I'm your co-host, Brad Newcomb. The British Columbia government is in the midst of a treaty-making process with the Aboriginal people of BC. And our guest is the Honourable John Kishore, who is the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, and he's also the MLA for Coquitlam Mallardville. Welcome, John. Thank you. Good to be here with both of you. Right. I'd like to start talking to you a little bit about your personal background. I know that you came into politics after spending 25 years as a United Church minister. What prompted you to make that switch? Well, I, w with, with your experience in the United Church ministry yourself, Brad, I think you'd be aware that that's, uh, that's pretty good training for um, going into a profession that's uh, people-oriented, that's uh, involved with issues that have to do with um, changes that are taking place within society that cause us to reflect on values in terms of how we would like to see those changes emerge. And I think you've spent a lot of hours in, uh, in committees working on different projects, often advising government as to what the church thinks government should be doing. So here I uh, find that uh, fate has brought me to a point where I'm in, a, in the other position now. and. Uh, it's quite fascinating sometimes to reflect back on my earlier life when I was often involved with the lobbying groups and social justice groups that were part of the church that were going to government to say, uh, here's how we think you should be uh, changing the way you're doing things. So now you're on the other side. Has it lived up to your expectations? Uh, yes and no. It's um, one of those things where you have to be there to really um, <laughs> realize what it is. Uh, there is, it certainly is true that when you're in a position of power that that can play tricks with your mind with regard to uh, self-importance and that sort of thing. And um, uh, so in, in terms of expectations, one has to be constantly dealing with the fact that you're in quite a, that it's quite a privilege to, to be in that position and, and to be dealing with the, those kinds of things. And uh, for instance, when I was Minister of the Environment, uh, I was traveling to the most amazing places in the province because we were involved in this protected area strategy and there were times that I sort of had to pinch myself and say, am I really doing this? <laughs> you know, if anybody, uh, they're, they're actually paying me to do this. Uh, so in that sense, it's kind of surprising, but with regard to uh, expectations, uh, you really do get to work on some of the things that you were expecting to work on and wanting to do but at the same time you find out that there's a limitation to what you can do in a period of time and part of it is to be able to pace uh, what you're doing and the other thing is uh, to realize that there's a vast uh, number of constituencies out there, uh, interests, and it's really important to hear them and for them to have an opportunity to have their voice heard because quite often the the preconceived ideas that you have when you come into elected office, uh, they, they have to stand the test of, of what others where, have of where to tell people you. are at. Exactly. So, so just want to, before we get into the, the conversation around the tree making process, uh, I know that as a, as a minister, often someone may say, well, what do you do? I mean, all you're there doing is something on Sunday morning. So what, describe uh, to the two of us uh, a week in the life of a cabinet minister. What do you do? Well, okay. A typical uh, week. A typical sure. week. Sure. Uh, okay. Well, uh, Without going into a great deal of detail, uh, this morning I um, got up quite early and uh, came down to the Bayshore Inn where I got on a plane, uh, met uh, on the plane Minister Mo Sohoda and together, together um, with some staff we traveled up to Squamish and then we um, went into Squamish where we announced the, uh, uh, the turning the Squamish Chief Mountain into a park. Uh, the people of the Squamish First Nation were there along, uh, along with the mayor of Squamish, so it was a multifaceted event that we were all participating in and we were recognizing uh, 
uh, the importance of uh, working with the community to bring that sort of thing about. At the same time, we were realizing the very many, many interests, the, the First Nation, the uh, local council, and also the government. So it was something that we'd worked on together. Then I came back and um, met with staff and uh, then had a meeting with the uh, editorial board of the Vancouver Sun, which lasted for an hour and a half. And then uh, from there went off to uh, another meeting and then uh, did a little preparation for, uh, for today. Now, uh, tomorrow I'll be, um, uh, I'll be heading back to Victoria uh, tonight and tomorrow I'll be at a cabinet meeting. And that cabinet meeting will last uh, most of the day. And then following that there will be uh, there are some issues that I'm working on where uh, staff in the a Aboriginal Affairs Ministry are wanting to brief me to prepare me for meetings that are coming up where we will be discussing the application of some of the, uh, some of the decisions that we are making that uh, are dealing with treaty making and other um, issues relating to uh, Aboriginal people. So it sounds like a pretty full schedule, I mean, uh, that you've got day yeah. after day after day of, of those kinds of things. Exactly, and there's all, just to add to that, there are also uh, meetings with uh, what, what we call um, the, the various uh, interest groups that are out there. Uh, because we're getting into uh, uh, negotiating treaties in the province, people are dealing with change looming over their lives, and so we're, we're meeting with them okay. too. Okay, I have one more question before Val gets into some of these treaty-making uh, questions, mm -hmm. but that is that you were Minister of the Environment, and, it, and, and that has some perks, because, I mean, you declare a new park, and just about everybody's happy, except maybe a few mm -hmm. developers, and, and we aren't going to lose sleep over their unhappiness over that, because we all love to see mm -hmm. new parks. Now you're Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, and it seems to me that that's almost a no-win situation, that someone is going to end up unhappy. So how do you sort of maintain your sense of hope and uh, faith and, and uh, walk that fine line? Oh, well, the first thing, I think you have to have a, a sense of keeping your eye on the ball and knowing what, the, uh, what you hope the end result will be. And uh, so you start off realizing that we're dealing with a very uncertain situation now where uh, we simply cannot leave this confusion to another generation. So then you have to, I have to say to myself, this is a, a time of, of great change. People who are worried and fearful that's what happens when there's change. So there's a real need to be able to respond to their questions. So the fact is people are very, very anxious. Uh, people are not, they haven't been through this before. People are often uh, not inclined to trust politicians. So there are a number of factors there as you've, I think, have described it very well in comparing those two portfolios. Uh, one of the things that helps me a lot is um, my family. Uh, they have a sense of uh, the purpose uh, with, with regard to what I'm doing. Another thing is when we campaigned to be government, we said we were going to do this, so we felt we had a mandate. Uh, and another thing is that uh, we're hearing from the most, most of the people in the province that they really do want treaties to be settled. So we have a sense that there is a, a desire out there to see this happen. But it is true that uh, there's a great deal of concern, some suspicion, and uh, we are, I'm criticized by my friends in the uh, Aboriginal community and I have a background there, so that, that's true. I think perhaps I've lost some friends because of positions that I've taken. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, I have uh, people that I've worked with for a long time that um, are in the forest industry and uh, in other interest uh, areas that are also very concerned. And therefore, uh, we may have a very cordial relationship, but when it comes down to the nitty gritty of the things that we're dealing with, I'm, I'm in a hot seat. There's no question about that. How do I cope with it? I get a lot of support, as I said, from my family and f I, from, the, uh, from the church community. Uh, I have a lot of people that don't necessarily have my same politics, but they say, we're praying for you and we're, we're glad you're there. That's very reassuring. And I, I still have uh, friends that uh, have been friends for a long time and they're still friends. That helps a lot. That's <laughs> good. When we hear so much about the treaty making process and, and the process for many years, as I remember when the NDP, when you're the party you belong to and represent, was not in government and the commitment that the NDP has, has verbalized in papers throughout the years. As a First Nations person myself who lives in an urban setting far removed from my own homeland, I find it difficult to keep up with what is happening in the treaty making process. So I can only imagine what people at large must feel. So I thought a good place to start might be 
in a nutshell, what is the treaty making process and where are we within that now? Sure. Okay, the, the, the um, BC Treaty Commission was set up as a result of work that was done uh, between Canada, British Columbia and the First Nations Summit. And there was a common ground there and the common ground was that um, by sitting down together and negotiating we should be able to achieve a certainty that at the current time is not available. Uh, a lot of people have uh, concerns uh, with regard to the relationships between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people and quite often those concerns are expressed as complaints about the treaty process. But when you really analyze them, they're complaints about the status quo. The status quo has problems. For instance, there, uh, we have an Indian Act that has uh, been uh, come about as a law that Aboriginal people had no input into and yet it's become a very controlling factor in their lives. It has to be unraveled and it has to be uh, replaced. So that is one of the, the reasons for doing this. Um, the, the Treaty Commission itself was set up uh, two years ago and there are now um, 48 First Nations that have filed statements of intent to negotiate a claim that uh, includes 70 percent of the Aboriginal people of the province and uh, Many of those, uh, now 17 of them, have negotiated openness agreements uh, and uh, 17 have uh, concluded framework agreements and are getting ready to go into the agreement in principle negotiation stage. So uh, while Gustafson Lake was happening, for instance, another five First Nations entered this process and they said, we want to be part of a solution. We don't want confrontation. We believe if we do sit down together, as Joe Mathias has said, we can negotiate our way into Canada and into British Columbia instead of the other way around. So when we look at a specific claim, for example, the Niska of mm -hmm. the Northwest, who have been sitting at one table or another for many, many, many years, years, two and a half decades or so, what was behind the the, the absence of the provincial politicians at the table the last time, which okay. is fairly recently. Okay, first of all, that was, uh, uh, the, the, it'll take me a little while to, to, to go into this, but um, the, it's a tripartite process. So there's not a meeting unless the three parties agree that there's a meeting. We had not agreed that there was a meeting because we there was unfit. The three parties, I'm sorry, the federal government, the provincial government, and the Nishka. The provincial government had not agreed that there was to be a meeting on that occasion. So that was a staged event where the Nishka and the federal government wanted to embarrass the provincial government because we had left the talks temporarily because the federal government at that point was not willing to follow through on a cost-sharing commitment. It, we insisted, as had been the case when this cost-sharing agreement was negotiated, that it would apply to each and every treaty in the province. When we found out that they would not be willing to apply what we had agreed on with regard to the uh, cash offer for the Nishka, that, that that formula would not apply to the other treaties, uh, I, in very good conscience, said we will not proceed with these negotiations till we get this matter settled because it would mean we would have a very untimely delay and uh, perhaps an unfair representation of the costs if we did not have the formula applied correctly. Now, I know a lot of this is very new to your listeners, and I also know that it was a very difficult thing for the Nishka because they had negotiated in good faith for 20 years. Uh, I would also point out to you that um, just prior to that, I had set a deadline on negotiations and there was more productivity that came out of those negotiations in six weeks than had been in the previous 20 years. And one thing I don't want to do while I'm the minister is to be a party to setting up a negotiations industry because I think these negotiations have to lead to finality. There have to be timelines and 20 years of negotiations is unacceptable. So. Having said all of that, and, and at the end of the day, looking back over some of the negotiations that we've heard about, for example, the Niska or Nishka being the most well-known, because that was one group that went to court some time ago, what is the justice in this? Where is the justice in this for First Nations, for uh, Canadian people at large, for all levels of government? Well, I'm, I'm going to suggest a concept to you that I think um, 
I, th that I feel very solid about, but I'd be interested in what you think about it. Uh, and I would say the starting point, uh, well, I guess the starting point has to be recognizing historic reality. But I think that the, um, the, 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 the value that will result in the best negotiations is one of enlightened self-interest. Now, what do you mean by enlightened self-interest? Yeah. I think sure. enlightened self-interest means that the, the treaties that are being crafted in the modern context have to be achievable. We cannot put toothpaste back into a tube. We cannot recreate what existed 125 years ago. We have to find a way through, in a respectful relationship, to craft an agreement where everybody benefits and everybody gives. So how does everybody... And, and I, I'm saying that enlightened self-interest means that if each of the parties that are at that table negotiates in good faith vigorously on behalf of their constituency, that we have the best chance of, uh, of an agreement being made that will be of benefit to all. We have to be neighbors in the post-treaty environment, and it's very essential that people get along together and that the end of a treaty being completed, that any one of these parties not feel that they have got, uh, got a bad deal. So I'm saying enlightened self-interest means that, uh, that this should make sure that, that all of us are, are working and uh, to, to present our best position at the table. So, so maybe we could, we could try that now. I mean, I, I'll, I'll represent the non-Aboriginal community and, and say that there are fears about losing property or, or losing access mm -hmm. to rivers and, and lakes, for instance. And, and Val, I mean, you could then... Well, sure. I, I think it would be very good to set up a simulation exercise where people actually would be given certain conditions uh, and play the role of the federal negotiator, the provincial negotiator, and the, and the uh, First Nations negotiator. And I think that uh, then they should be given certain background with regard to, uh, okay, if, it, uh, if it's one kind of a settlement, uh, is it going to be something that uh, ruins the, uh, the existing economic activity? Uh, if it's another kind of a settlement, is it a settlement that, that can dovetail in with the existing act, uh, economic activity? If it's another kind of a settlement, is it one in which the existing activity can find that there are new partnerships with the First Nations who are uh, now uh, receiving uh, some cash and some land as a result of the cost sharing process that has been developed? So I think that each party in looking at that needs to be looking at, at what the possibilities are. I guess speaking not on behalf of anybody, but as an Aboriginal person, having been involved on the peripheries of some of these issues from a communications background, something that strikes me as being very real is that one of the barriers that exists to just settlements, maybe plural as opposed to singular, really has to do with fears and unknowns. And there are a lot of fears in the Aboriginal communities about where this process is leading and the faith of the parties involved. Exactly, and, uh, and part of the discomfort uh, of, of being in my position from time to time is the fears on both sides, the fears from the Aboriginal community and the fears in the non-Aboriginal non community. And uh, uh, up in uh, Wet'suwet'en country, up, up in Smithers, uh, a few months ago now, the uh, Smithers Town Council and the uh, Wet'suwet'en uh, negotiating team and some of their hereditary chiefs got together and had dinner and they met informally and uh, then they uh, just had a really good chat and they got to know each other and they talked about their vision and this, had, this, this reduced fears like letting air out of a tire. Can I ask uh, you about a uh, fear that the government might have and that is about being re-elected and given the, some of the scandals and so on around Bingo Gate and those kinds of things, do you think that will f play any part in uh, slowing the process down? Well, there's always that speculation out there but I think there are some things that are more important than uh, large P politics and I can't, I really can't say what the large P political advantage is in slowing the process down. Uh, we're judged by what we do and I think that uh, if we were to do that uh, on the basis of that kind of timing that um, it, that would that would be pretty transparent. Mm -hmm. So one of, one of the questions I have too in, in sort of, and again it's, it's difficult to keep track of all the things mm -hmm. that go on but and I think Gustafson Lake uh, highlighted that is that there are more than one voice in the Aboriginal community. And for those of us who are following the treaty-making process, 
Uh, who do we listen to in the Aboriginal community, and how do we make those distinctions? Well, I think that you have to struggle with that more than I do. You know, I, I, one of the things that's really bothered me is the silence of the uh, faith community uh, while I've been, you know, trying to deal with some of the issues I've been struggling with. Uh, I used to be able to count at one time on uh, Ray Hord of the Board of Evangelism and Social Service to be speaking out on issues that uh, that cabinet ministers were wrestling with at that big table. And uh, there's been all too much silence, I think, coming from the faith community with regard to some of these issues. But um, Gustafson Lake, for instance, it's my view that that was a criminal activity which did not have so the support of the people in whose traditional territory that was. So the uh, Caribou Tribal Council and the uh, Canoe Creek Band and others, I think, were absolutely exemplary in the in the way in which uh, they they evidenced their spirituality while maintaining that they abhorred this kind of violence, and they tried and, and were ultimately effective in in having this brought to a, a, a conclusion without there being bloodshed. Well, I think uh, people yeah. found that somewhat confusing because. The bodies that, that you mentioned, the Tribal Council and, and the band, are actually a result of the Indian Act. They're not part of a hereditary system. And so you have that confusion, I think, in people's minds. And I think sometimes the public wants an easy answer. Sometimes the public wants to have one Aboriginal group or one Aboriginal person represent all Aboriginal people still under the misconception that Aboriginal people are a homogeneous type of bunch. And so your comments about Gustafson Lake and, and about the silence of the, the faith community make me wonder if maybe that isn't almost somewhat appropriate for the faith community to observe and to try to grapple with and understand this before actually leaping in and, and taking action when it hasn't been asked for or when it might not be appropriate. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Valerie. My comment was more in terms of the overarching issue okay. going back for, for, for quite some time. But I think that uh, what happens is that when something like that, like that comes along, then, then we do have a vacuum when an event like that happens. But uh, what I wanted to say was um, uh, the Caribou Tribal Council was exemplary. They have filed with the Treaty Commission. They want a negotiated uh, settlement. They spoke up with regard to that being the only way to deal with this very confusing situation. And, uh, and so while all that was going on, another five First Nations entered the treaty process, which meant that was still happening, that was still going on. All the attention went to this place where there was potential violence, which really wasn't, in, in some ways, it really wasn't uh, uh, a, a land issue, uh, but in, while that was going on, more First Nations were coming into that process. At the same time, I was hearing stories of uh, children of uh, Aboriginal families being uh, uh, beaten up uh, in areas where, where their people were going into the treaty process and were somehow being lumped in with those who were, were involved in that kind of an activity. So I think, again, uh, education with regard to the diversity, uh, you know, there's, why wouldn't there be the same diversity among First Nations in British Columbia as you'd find in the, in the United Nations? And of course it is First yeah. Nations, not yeah. nation, Nations. And these people have great diversity, different approaches, different understandings of how to resolve issues and, and, and so, so Culture and tradition and so on. <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to ask, because, because you bring to uh, your position those 25 years as United Church Minister, and now you're on the political end of things. Uh, and as, as Val mentioned, I mean, sometimes it's, it's easy to run in and say things, and the church does that quite easily and readily sometimes without maybe observing and listening and learning. Can you give some sort of helpful hints in, or strategies as to what is effective and what isn't now from your side on the, on the political fence? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, I think the, the faith community needs to ask itself if uh, what what the, the idea of the faith community is or the social justice community on the way to resolve this uh, historic impasse, which we, this confusion that we cannot leave to future generations. They should examine critically the treaty making process, for instance, and if they find within that process something that they can affirm and support, then I think they should do that. Because I don't know if anybody's been paying attention, but because for the last 14 months, 
there's been a Donnybrook going out there uh, with regard to uh, some very strident voices expressing a great deal of fear and concern and uh, some voices saying they want this whole process set aside. So what I'm saying is that if all the shots that are coming at me, uh, who stands in the middle, are coming from one side, uh, then it sends a kind of a message that there isn't a lot of support there from, the, from others other than the Aboriginal community with regard to another perspective. And it's not so much to say, I'm not saying that the justice community should say the government's doing the right thing. That's not it. They should be talking about the issues, not the government. And I think that in doing that, it helps to put a balance out there where the, uh, where the body politic, where the fabric of our society is coming from in terms of its, its understandings of these issues. So we're hearing from some voices or voices from some communities, we can call them that, right. and an absence of voices from others. Well, that's my perception. I'm, I'm going to be prepared to have it challenged, but uh, I would certainly uh, invite uh, you, uh, anyone to review the, uh, uh, what's been in the media for the last uh, 14 mm -hmm. months, and I would say that, that there's been a, a bit of an imbalance there. Uh, recently, I think that's uh, been changing, uh, but uh, I just go back to the days when I think, for instance, let me give you an example on the gambling issue. I don't know, the United Church, people sometimes say that's the only thing where the United Church has a really solid uh, position. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yes, okay. But, 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 uh, but on that issue, I, I th again, I think that the, uh, when we were, uh, you know, there was a great deal of comment on it. I, I think it was quite a long time before the social justice community got its voice, got its oar in. But it did get it in. Finally, yep. It took a little bit of prodding, actually. So whose responsibility is it to educate the public? Is it the politicians' responsibility to educate the people who elected them in their writings? Whose responsibility is it really to well, educate the public? Politicians have a very clear responsibility, but it's a very, we're very limited in how we can fulfill that responsibility. We all have a responsibility when it comes to education. There, there's formal education and then there's the education that comes out of a healthy dialogue and a lively interaction on issues. And I think where it comes to that, I think we all have a responsibility. John, yeah. I'd like to thank you for being our guest on Pressure Point. John Kishore, Minister of Aboriginal Affairs and MLA for Coquitlam Millardville. This has been Pressure Point. I'm Valerie Dudeward, and my co-host has been Brad Newcomb. Thank you for joining us. The preceding program was produced through the facilities of Rogers Community 4, Vancouver. We want to hear from you and invite you to leave your comments and suggestions on our 24-hour response line message machine. Please call 731-5812.